Good morning and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. This is Debar Sanyal and here are the top stories for the day. Low-cost carrier GoFirst has run out of runway. Its entire fleet is grounded and the company is at the doors of the bankruptcy court. The sudden development has not just shocked the flyers, but the regulator too, which is now scrambling for answers. But why did the airline come to a grinding halt? And what does it mean for the flyers and for the aviation industry? Bhashwar Kumar unravels the knots. With their flights cancelled and travel plans appended, people took to Twitter to express disappointment with GoFirst. The company shocked everyone on Tuesday by grounding its fleet till May 5th and approaching the National Company Law Tribunal for voluntary insolvency. The Vadia Group-owned airline was facing a cash crunch resulting from the grounding of nearly half its 57 aircraft. But why were almost half of GoFirst's planes grounded? The airline has blamed engine manufacturer Pratt & Whitney for it. In a statement, the company said that it had to take the tough decision due to the ever-increasing number of failing engines supplied by Pratt & Whitney. It said that the percentage of grounded aircraft due to its faulty engines had grown to 50% in December 2022, from 31% a year ago. As a result, its flights were cut almost by half in the past one year. GoFirst said the groundings had resulted in a revenue loss and additional expenses of 10,800 crore rupees. GoFirst also said that Pratt & Whitney had refused to comply with an award issued by an emergency arbitrator that directed the latter to dispatch a number of serviceable spare leased engines to the airline in tranches by December 2023. It added that if Pratt & Whitney were to comply with the orders in the award, GoFirst would be able to return to full operations by August or September 2023. Against this backdrop, are more flight cancellations likely? Do I foresee uh, further cancellations? Absolutely, yes. Because you have to understand that uh, under any aircraft lease agreements, the minute you have an airline which, which goes into an insolvency mode, uh, it allows the lessors to immediately uh, terminate their lease agreements and get the aircraft back. While GoFirst's domestic market share stood at 6.9% in March, it had still been flying around 200 flights and carrying up to 30,000 passengers daily during the past few days. With GoFirst grounded, India now has 12 airlines that flyers can opt for for domestic travel. Compare this to the 43 scheduled passenger airlines China has and the 63 in the US. Overall, customer choice will be somewhat restricted. But what will be the impact on flight ticket prices? It is going to be a temporary blip in a, in a, in a, in a long-term fare stabilization. Uh, what, what is going to be interesting, it, it, this provides a lifeline now to SpiceJet uh, or airlines which are, let's say, like SpiceJet or TrueJet who have been trying to look at expanding, a CASA which have been trying to look at expanding. That gives them a little bit of uh, maneuverable flexibility specifically with slots out of key airports. So, you know, you will be able to really fill in the capacity fairly quickly. So, would you see a, a significant rise in fares? No. Uh, would you see a temporary rise in fare? Maybe about 6-7%. But there is an alternate view regarding fares too. The future fate of GoAir depends and begins and ends with what Pratt & Whitney is willing to support. Right now, it makes no sense for GoAir to change the engine option to go for something else. Like, like at least Indigo managed to do because 90% of Goa's revenue fleet is the NEO. And let me be very clear, if Goa goes under, we're looking at direct impact to the Indian traveler where the cost of travel is not only just going to go up, but it's going to be so out of reach that we're actually going to eventually shrink the air travel market where, where by force, travelers will have to resort to rail travel. We will have to wait and watch which direction fares head towards in the coming days.
For its part, the Directorate General of Civil Aviation has issued a show cause notice to go first for non-intimation about flights cancelled on May 3rd and 4th. But has the regulator been proactive enough in the case of go first? The government and, and its machinery should have stepped up and supported Go Air or taken up their matter and their cause uh, with Pratt and Whitney and also with the US government and the FAA. So the DGCA can't always play the Daroga Saab and the Turum Khan attitude in such cases. The DGCA needs to start supporting the industry as well as support the airline. And I still don't understand what result does the DGCA want to get by issuing a show cause notice to Go Air. I mean, the writing is on the wall. They knew about this engine issue for the last five years. Shares of Interglobe Aviation, which operates the country's biggest low-cost airline, Indigo, hit a 52-week high, surging 8% on the BSE in May 3rd's intraday trade, while those of SpiceJet and Jet Airways rallied 6% and 5% following the insolvency plea by GoFirst. Its rival airlines will now look to gain its market share. Against this backdrop, what will GoFirst's troubles mean for the aviation sector? And could a duopoly be its future? What I see actually is uh, any of these airlines which are expanding, which could be a Casa or Star Air, and that's why I'm saying watch out for Star Air because I think uh, with with this opportunity coming in, I think we can look at probably an up gauge of some of the aircraft in in uh, in these smaller players, uh, and I think it would relatively still be. Uh, a 70-30 market, 70% will still be controlled by the top two guys and the 30% is where everyone else will be playing around. The 70% is going to be between the Air India group and the, uh, I mean, Tata's uh, with, with the Air India Vistara and all of them uh, together. So I'll call them as a Tata group. So it is going to be between Tata group and Indigo. These are the two guys who will control 70% of the market. GoFirst has moved a US court to enforce the Singapore International Arbitration Commission's order against Pratt & Whitney. And after it filed for insolvency, Union Aviation Minister Jyoti Raditya Sindhya said the government had been assisting the airline in every possible manner. This may leave some room for a recovery, but things look grim for Go First at present. But it looks like the electric vehicles have hit a smooth runway and are now ready to take off in India. The competition is heating up too. So far, Tata Motors has been the leader, but others are catching up. After Pune, Mahindra & Mahindra is going to set up its second manufacturing plant in Telangana. It plans to sell more than 2 lakh EVs by FY27. But can it catch up with Tata? Tushar Verma has the answers. Electric vehicles are in the fast lane in India. In 2022, more than 10 lakh battery-operated vehicles were registered in India, according to the Vahan portal of the Indian government. In 2023 so far, about 4.67 lakh of battery-operated electric vehicles have already been registered. This is 46% of all the registrations in 2022. With a range of affordable electric cars already in its portfolio, Tata Motors has established itself as a front-runner in the EV space. According to a Canalys Automotive report, Tata Motors commands a tremendous 86% market share in the Indian EV space. Its closest competitors are Morrison Garages with 9% share, followed by Hyundai with just 2%. Tata Motors is ranked third in the overall automobile market in India with 14%. Tata Motors is now in talks with sovereign wealth funds and private equity investors to raise up to $1 billion via stake sale to expand its EV business. According to its quarterly results, the automaker sold 50,000 electric passenger vehicles in FY23. This was a growth of over 154% from FY22. So, in an expanding EV space, what advantages does Tata have and will it continue to remain a market leader? We should not see Tata as Tata Motors only. We should see Tata as a Tata group. I think undoubtedly they are something, you know, which are invincible uh, in electric war in India. The few advantages, I think if you see Tata already had a very good dealer network, right? So uh, 
uh, I think uh, two months back, they were the number two player, you know, beating the Hyundai event. As I said, you know, we should see them more as a group, right? So Tata Chemicals, uh, along with Tata Motors, is really working on battery technologies, right? Um, uh, so if you see TCS along with Tata Motors, you know, so they really have a great advantage. Building softwares, you know, which you may be requiring uh, to really differentiate themselves, you know, from the other players, uh, whosoever will be offering. Another automotive giant, Mahindra & Mahindra, also has ambitious plans to plow into the EV space in India. While it commands a 9% share in the overall automobile market in India, its presence in the electric passenger vehicle space is negligible. Well, talking of electric, Mahindra is a leader in the Formula E electric car racing championship and dominates the commercial electric three-wheeler segment with a 67.2% market share. Though Mahindra is yet to crack the personal EV segment, it is looking to raise up to $1.3 billion for its EV expansion. In December last year, the automaker announced plans to invest $1.21 billion to set up an EV manufacturing plant near Pune in Maharashtra. Mahindra dominates the Indian roads with its SUVs. In fact, its entry into the EV space was also through the launch of XUV400, which is an electric SUV. The company is planning to launch at least five more EV models in the next few years. So, are there any roadblocks ahead in the automaker's journey to the Indian EV market? It's important to understand that first, uh, Mahindra was the earliest mover in electric vehicles. Uh, a lot of people forget that they actually acquired Reva in 2009 and 10. I think after Reva and maybe an E uh, vehicle which uh, Mahindra actually did earlier, they are still in the process of building the new, uh, you know, uh, SUV uh, electric vehicle is yet, uh, you know, to gain traction and come out in a significant manner. So first is the need of product, right? Second, they'll have to position it um, well. And also, you know, they'll have to actually get strategic alliances because a lot of the passenger, quote, unquote, passenger vehicles are being sold in the public transportation uh, segment, uh, right? And the third is that they'll have to actually look at the entire financing and, you know, incentivizing the buyers uh, with a product finance mix uh, going, for, uh, going forward. And once they do that, then I think they'll be able to get traction in the electric space, in the electric vehicle space. Both Tata Motors and Mahindra are Indian automotive giants. While the Tata commands the majority of the EV space in India, it lags behind Mahindra in the overall passenger automobile numbers. Is it then possible for Mahindra to catch up with Tata in the EV market? If you talk about Mahindra and Mahindra, most of their sales is uh, revolved around diesel, right? Which is obviously not the future fuel. Uh, so I think they, their management is also trying to reorient you know, you know, themselves and move directly from diesel to electrification strategy. You know, which obviously, uh, you know, is is going to put them, you know, among the top key players in India. But obviously, you know, being number one, because they are not into the mass market, which is less than 10 lakhs, right, or less than 15 lakhs. So I think it will be difficult for them to, you know, be in the top rankings. And uh, the only thing is that mantra for success for Mahindra and Mahindra would be more of collaboration, uh, you know, with the external players, you know. So, uh, so I think because they have to depend also for technology, you know, but I think collaboration would be the key to Mahindra's success uh, in India. With the Indian government's push to transform 30% passenger vehicles into electric and 70% of commercial vehicles by 2030, the EV market is poised to grow in India. However, with 1.3% of the total automotive market as on FY23, EV sales are yet to catch up in India. This certainly allows Mahindra a significant space for growth. While EV race hots up in India, the one in the sky is left with one less competitor. Gopher says that it could no longer continue to meet financial obligations. With the development still unfolding, how should investors approach the listed aviation stocks? Nikita Vashisht brings us some answers. As news surrounding GoFirst's bankruptcy unfolded, shares of rival firms took flight at the bosses. Shares of Interglobe Aviation, the parent firm of Indigo, zoomed 8% in the intraday trade, while those of SpiceJet and Jet Airways rallied up to 6%. Analysts expect the aviation stocks to continue to climb in the near term, as the surprise bankruptcy filing by GoFirst is likely to lead to supply constraints in terms of total seats on offer across airlines.
So I think there are pure momentum plays because what happens in terms of both the regulator and what the government probably does, uh, I think it's going to be key. Because with uh, such scenarios probably coming in and with the airline season coming through, the tourist season, as we call it, uh, for April and May as well, specifically for May as the season has just started, uh, I think any cancellations of this front might spur ticket prices for other airlines as well. Uh, so I think capping of prices, as I pointed out, I think is also going to be a key criteria here. If that probably happens, I think it just caps out the expected potential runaway gains uh, that existing plans like India might have. Domestic airlines flew 13 million passengers in March 2023, up 21.4% year-on-year. Between January and March this year, domestic airlines carried 37.5 million passengers as opposed to 24.72 million during the same period last year. The recent developments with GoFirst and Lists Field could boost the coffers of airlines over time amid relatively high passenger load, provided the aviation turbine fuel or ATF prices and other costs remain in check. Go first commanded a market share of approximately 8 to 9 percent. Okay, and uh, the suspension effectively means that uh, there is a supply crunch uh, in the industry, and obviously, the existing players uh, will benefit out of it, uh, be it Indigo or uh, any other operational players like Akata Air, etc., Air India, uh, uh, also you might fall in that list. So uh, basically, yeah, uh, the other operators uh, can be benefit, especially in an environment where uh, the airports are at uh, sky high level and uh, the occupancy levels uh, are upwards of about 70 percent. From the listed space, analysts prefer Indigo over SpiceJet due to the former's market leadership and strong balance sheet position. I think the only thing to from the are there. From a balance sheet perspective, which has survived those cycles, uh, Indigo and Air India, I think that momentum probably stays with it by the listed entity at this juncture uh, and probably might uh, for the rest of uh, this quarter and the next quarter as well, until we probably see firming up of plans happening and deliveries happening, both in terms of wet leases that other aircraft players can probably do or resolutions happening on the existing prices. So with tailwinds acting in favor of it, yeah, I think the momentum for Indigo might vary well. In a nutshell, while short-term traders could scalp immediate gains, analysts suggest long-term investors continue to hold on to the stocks. On Thursday, markets will react to the US Fed's interest rate decision. Besides, Q4 results of Adani Enterprises, Dabur India, HDFC Hero Motor Corp, Tata Power and TVS Motor Company will be tracked by the markets. theme of markets, regulator SEBI has given nod to Tata Play's proposed public issue. The Tata Group firm has taken the confidential filing route for its IPO as it wants to keep the draft red herring prospectus to be under the wraps for a while. But what exactly is confidential IPO filing? We decode it for you. Markets Regulators Securities and Exchange Board of India, or SEBI, had introduced confidential filing of draft Red Herring Prospectus, or DRHP, in India in November last year. And on December 1, Tata Play became the first firm to pre-file confidential papers with the regulator for an IPO. And it got the regulator's observation letter on April 26. But what is a confidential filing or pre-filing? Under it, DRHP, which contains vital information about the company's businesses and financials and must be compulsorily made public, is actually not made public. Confidential filing provides companies the option to keep their financial data private in case they want to call off listing plans later. Their offer document will be open to scrutiny from the regulator and exchanges 
but will not be open to the public. The purpose of a confidential IPO is to give companies flexibility over information flow and withhold sensitive information from the competitors. Many companies, despite obtaining the SEBI go-ahead for IPOs, have not been able to launch their issue. This new route will help companies explore listing options without unwarranted public scrutiny and opportunistic litigation. Though the details of the offer documents will remain confidential, an issuer will have to disclose that they have pre-filed for an IPO and it does not necessarily mean that the issuer shall undertake an IPO. The idea is to give issuers time to explore the IPO route. The company will have to file an updated DRHP, which will be a public document, once SEBI issues its observations and the company decides to launch its IPO. The updated DRHP will be the first public document from the issuer and before this, the company will not showcase key performance indicators through any means to the public. Before this, research reports based on confidential filing will also not be permitted. The validity of SEBI's observations may be increased to 18 months as against the current 12 months to give sufficient time to issuers for marketing and advertisements. Issuers will have to file an updated DRHP within 16 months from the date of SEBI observation. Countries such as the UK, Canada and US permit pre-filing of the offer document for review by the regulatory authorities. Subsequently, in case the issuers decide to proceed with the offer, the document incorporating changes mandated by the regulator is made available to the public. Companies such as Snapchat, Robinhood SurveyMonkey and Line have taken the confidential filing route. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. The new regulations may also include a test the water clause to help issuers gauge investor interest in advance. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log in to business-standard.com. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.